Um, we're in Luke, eight, at that last part of 18, very beginning of 19. And uh, I want to I wanna highlight uh, something going in. Uh, I'm going to be asking you this question. What's the difference? So I'm going to ask you to have this intellectual exercise of, of as you hear, we talk about, we, we'll preach the, the we'll, We'll read the story, talk about it, then we'll transition to the other story. There's two of them. Um, and there's, very, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of similarities. So many similarities that it's not a coincidence. But I want you to listen for the difference because the difference is telling. The first time I ever heard these, these, uh, these passages uh, where I was in, in 1981, I was at a, a place outside of Buena Vista, Colorado at a camp called Frontier Ranch, which is a young life camp. And the day or two days before um, I gave my life to Christ, I became a Christian and began this whole journey. Uh, these two passages were, pre- were, were preached, were, that was the part of the talk. And we know from, another, uh, from the other gospels that this blind man we're talking about on the side of the road, is, his name is Bartimaeus. Um, and, and then this Zacchaeus, this tax collector. This guy, when he, his name was Jay. He was a speaker. That's all I remember about him other than he was the one that preached the word in such a way that I gave my life to Christ. He asked the question that Jesus asks. He said, if I'm Jesus and I'm standing here asking this of you, what do you want me to do for you? Like, I don't ever... Never thought about Jesus asking me anything, much less, what do you want me to do for you? And so I want you to listen to that and see what Bartimaeus says he needs, but see that Jesus gave him more than he asked for. And then this guy climbed up in a tree that was inside the kind of sanctuary at Frontier Ranch and climbed up in a tree and preached about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who climbed up a sycamore tree. So I have very vivid pictures. Now, he didn't go to this difference between these passages, and I, I, the difference will be the end. But these, these passages have significance to me because it was days before I went, my eternal address changed. And I just still remember this guy, and I was thinking, man, he is old, but he has so much energy, and he couldn't, he's probably 10 years younger than I am now um, when, when he preached, but phenomenal communicator. So I hope I can do these passages justice. It reads like this, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. There's an exclamation point, and it says that he called out so I can be loud. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Then Jesus stopped, and he ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, He received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Now, this is not an uncommon story. We know this story. Most people know this story. Um, There's a little song that goes with it. There's, there's, um, There's a song that goes with a wee little man that's in the next passage too. Uh, Great story. Here's a man, probably his whole life has been blind. Maybe he got a a disease or an illness or something later in life. But nevertheless, he is incapable of doing anything for a living, anything productive in his culture and in society, other than rattling a can or holding up. They didn't have cardboard, but, you know, we see them on the side of the road. We'll work for food, but he can't work. So blind, hungry Will you feed me or will you give me money for food? That's the, this, this guy's life has been brought down to this. Now, I find it curious that, that he's on the side of the road as people are going into Jericho. And he hears, doesn't see, but hears the crowd going by. And he goes, wait, what's, what's going on? Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shut your mouth. It says rebuke. That doesn't say kindly, hey, just a, a, a kind suggestion. Just shh. It's more of one of these, this is an important man. Who do you think you are? You shush. In fact, if you do any, we're going to, these guys, they'll take you away. But what does he do? He does the socially unacceptable thing, and he cries out all the louder. Now, just to have some idea of what this means, I want to I I remind you that we're most, you're not all Dutch. I get it. But you live in a Dutch, Dutch culture, right? And there are some things that are socially acceptable. And there are some things that are socially 
unacceptable. There are some things that are socially inappropriate, and there are some things that are socially appropriate. Okay, we get it. There are some traditions in church that in order to show how, how moved you are and how spiritual you are, you might stand up. These camera guys are going to hate me right now. They might stand up and raise their hands while they're singing. And it could be the widescreen TV. Stand up. It could be the carry something. It, Tim Hawkins. I know. I stole it. it. Or it could be that you get so moved that you start, you start running around. If that happened here, in some traditions, when something happens from the front that moves you or that seems true to you, you might say, amen. Or in some traditions, come on. In other traditions, preach it, brother. In others, just preach. It doesn't happen very often around here. In fact, it would, uh, what might go through your head if you felt like you, to say, you wanted to say an amen or something like that, and I'm not, I'm not asking for it, but if you were to, you might, the first thing that goes through your head is, what is my wife going to think? Not that a dude would ever do that. You might think, what are people going to think of me, right? So there's this socially acceptable and socially unacceptable thing. In one culture or in one tradition, it might be the thing that says you're spiritual. And in the other, it might say you're distracting from the worship and the proclamation of God. So it's not sinful. It's not wrong. It's not, it's just there are unwritten codes and unwritten rules and even unproclaimed codes and rules that we all live by. Blind people who are beggars and some dignitaries coming to town, you keep your mouth shut and hopefully people as they pass by will notice how dignified you are and they will throw some coins in your can. But he does the amen even when he's not supposed to. He calls out all the more louder. Son of David, which is a kingly term, have mercy on me. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't do what I would expect him to do. He doesn't, he doesn't, shh, stop, shh. Who was that? And then everyone kind of parts their way and he walks up to blind Bartimaeus. He orders the very people that were telling him to shush to go get him and bring him to Jesus. So here's this guy, calls out. He knows Jesus, he hears about Jesus, calls out. Jesus invites him to himself. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Now, there are two things that just happened. One is he got his sight. The other is, well, I'll get back to it in a minute. Je great, great story. Jesus entered Jericho. Same trip, probably depending on where they were on the road going up to Jericho. Same trip, 20 minutes, two hours, six hours. Bartimaeus says right here, that he immediately received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. So he's in the crowd as they come into Jericho. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man who was there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see, Je he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being sh a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead of the, and climbed up a sycamore tree or a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay in your house today. So he, Zacchaeus, came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be a guest of a sinner. Now, just so you know, this is one of those things preachers like and scholars a little bit. The word mutter, if you take from English to Greek, that's the original language, and then you translate to Hebrew and then back to English, same word used when the Israelites are wandering around in the desert and they're sick of the manna and the quail. Well, I don't want to have quail anymore. <laughs> And Moses calls out to God and goes, this rabble, these people, the, the saint, oh, I want to go back to Egypt. We had leeks. I have no idea what a leek is, but I promised myself I'd say it once, once a year. The word there for rumble or mutter or murmur, 
Same word. It's no accident that Luke chooses that that's the word that describes the people. It's a terrible response. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what is lost. A couple things, very similar. He hears that Jesus is coming, wants to connect in some way. He climbs up a tree. He doesn't yell out. Jesus invites him to come to him. He's completely transformed and becomes a follower of Christ. Very similar stories. And just so you know, their lives are transformed. And Jesus is real clear on his wording even though we missed something in English. With Bartimaeus, it says, your faith has healed you. Receive your sight. Receiving his sight, he's cured. Healed, sozo, it means delivered. It means saved. It means healed. It means all of it, not a piece of it, all of it, all of it. So Bartimaeus was not only, did not only have his sight restored, he was restored to his community in front of his community. Now he now gets to be a productive member of his culture. I don't know what skills he had because I don't know when he was blinded. But his family, his synagogue, his friends, everybody, he's no longer the beggar that they need to show pity on. He's the one that can now begin to earn a living and show pity on and, and, and give alms to others. When Jesus says, today salvation has come to your home, to Zacchaeus, salvation, same word, so so. He's delivered from who he was. He's healed of what bound him to other things. And he's, his eternal address changed because of an encounter with Jesus. Very similar stories. What's the difference? Well, let me tell you about tax collectors. You probably know. But the Roman occupying, oppressing government ruled over the Jewish people. And they collected taxes to keep the armies fighting and taking back more, or taking more territory. So the job of a tax collector, they always try to get someone who's part of that community so that, you know, they get an in. The job of a tax, collect, tax, collect, tax, tax, tax collector, tax collector is to, they usually sat out at a bench, but they would have to go to people's homes. And it didn't matter who they got the money from, as long as they got a certain amount of money from that neighborhood or that little province that they were in charge of. And they would collect it, and whatever, they would, whatever Rome required from this little area, they would, they would, they would collect it. Some more, they'd take some, more from some who were richer, less from others who, who didn't have as much. But whatever more they could get, they kept. Except that because it was kind of a multi-market or a multi-level marketing thing, um, that you paid, you, if you were the lowly tax collector, you had to pay a tax on the taxes that you collected to the person above you, to the person above you, to a chief tax collector. This guy's a chief tax collector. He's a rich man. And I love the fact that maybe he heard of the story just the chapter before of the rich young man who comes up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus, you know, he has this conversation and he says, well, keep the commandments. Well, I've kept all those since I was a kid. One thing you lack, sell everything you have, give to the poor, follow me. And just so you know, that guy walked away. So according to that story, that guy's eternal address did not change. But Jesus told him, you need to get rid of that which you are beholding to. You lack faith in God because you have things that own you. So maybe Zacchaeus has heard that rich men, when they have a con connection with Jesus, they have to immediately dispose, the, they, 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 have to, they have to get rid of some, some of their wealth. I don't know. But his immediate response was, I give half to the poor and anyone I've wronged, I'll repay it four times. That is an awesome transformative story. So what's the difference besides it's one guy's Bartimaeus, one guy's Zacchaeus, one guy's blind, one guy's a tax collector? What's the difference? I keep asking it. I know. But it's better, educators will tell you, it's better if you discover it for yourself than if I tell you. But just in case you're struggling, the difference isn't Jesus' interaction with a blind man 
or the tax collector. The difference is the people. Immediately, he, was, he received his sight and he followed Jesus, praising God. And all the people saw it. They also praised God. 20 minutes, two hours, six hours later, the same people and Zacchaeus, or Bartimaeus is in the crowd. Come down immediately. I must stay with you in your house. So he came down and he, he, he welcomed Jesus gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be with the guest of a sinner. Same response from Jesus. Same response from Bartimaeus and, for, and or Zacchaeus. The difference is the people. Why? Because you're allowed to hate tax collectors in that culture. They are traitors. They have sold out. They actually take that which empowers more the people that have power over you. You're allowed to hate them. And, and yeah, you're not supposed to hate rich people in their culture because, you know, when Jesus says it's harder for a rich man to get into the, in, in the kingdom of heaven that, or, than it is for a camel to go through the avenue, well, then who can be saved? Because if you're, if, you're, if you're rich, then God has blessed you. That means you're righteous. But there's an exception, a socially acceptable exception. Tax collectors are evil. And not only am I allowed to hate tax collectors, God hates tax collectors. That's why they're like, he's going to be with a sinner. So it's not the blind man or the sinner's response that's different. It's that people, are they celebrate and praise God for one, and they actually have negative things to say about God because of the other. So here's the question, because I think the difference is telling. Who is it you're allowed to hate? People on the other side of the political aisle? People on the other side of the abortion issue? Progressive? Conservative? Socialist? Anarchist? Certain sins we seem to be okay with. And certain sins we're like, no, not here. If you've got a picture or an idea in your head of who, now you'll never say it out loud, I get to hate these people. But don't we kind of, <sighs> some people decide that the morality of Scripture doesn't apply to them. And so as Christians, we go, I hold this dear. You say it doesn't apply. Oh, no. And I'm not for ever compromising a moral stance on sin that the Scripture holds. I don't think that we or our culture or our passions define morality or holiness. I think God does. But folks, just like I don't want someone taking something and throwing it out, I don't think we should do that either. And the hate rules have not changed. There is no one that Christians are allowed to hate. No one. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do not return evil with evil, but evil with kindness. Love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's not even suspicious. But these people felt completely righteous in rebuking what Jesus did for someone they're allowed to hate. Who are you allowed to hate? I'm not going to name a group because I don't want to let you off the hook. It might be a person. It might be an ex. It might be someone who abused you. I'm going to use this hyperbolic example because everyone, almost no one remembers, but I do. 30 years ago, there was a guy named Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was a cannibal and a serial killer. And he was finally found out, and he was arrested, and he was tried. It was very public. And then they put him in prison. And he was killed. He was beaten to death by other prisoners in prison. That's how he died. I don't know if the death penalty was in that state. I don't, I don't I remember that stuff. But I do, know, I do remember he was interviewed on 60 Minutes or Date Time or, you know, Dateline or whatever, Prime Time, whatever, one of those shows, about a week or two before he was murdered in prison. And he said this, I, since I've been in prison, I've come to realize that I am accountable so, to someone beyond myself. 
and he confessed that he had become a Christian. And Christians were ticked. It was in Christianity Today. It was on, it, we didn't have internet really back then, but it, it, it was on a TV show. Churches were talking about it. Christians were talking about it over coffee. Oh, and part of it I get, because part of it means that I don't want a guy like that associated with a guy like me. And I have that sometimes when I see some of these preachers on TV, I'm like, man, I'm kind of embarrassed of them. But is that okay? Because Jesus loves Jeffrey Dahmer as much as he loves you and me. And Jeffrey Dahmer knows Jesus right now better than anyone in this room because he's with him in the throne room. That's a hyperbot. That's a big one. Now bring it down. You and yours. Who is it that you've convinced yourself that you're allowed to hate? You're about to receive communion. The body and the blood of Christ. And I, am, I implore you, when you take that little cube of bread or that little gluten-free wafer and you're holding it and the tray's going around before the pastor stands up and says those last words, take, eat, remember, and believe, something to that effect, that you think about when that goes into your mouth, you're saying to Jesus, for all intents and purposes, become joint, come in, become part of me. And when you take that juice, that little cup, it is the blood of Jesus. And it's poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. And I ask you to consider this. If, if the blood of Christ is sufficient to forgive you your sins against God and against others, is it not sufficient to forgive someone else's sins against God and against others? If it is, then it's time for a heart check. Because we should live our lives in such a way that other people can tell who our God is. And we should behave in such a way toward others that people can tell how God behaves toward them. If Jesus loves you and was willing to give his life for you, then he loves the per your enemy. And he's willing, he was willing to give his life for them as well. Look, if we go down as Christians, I pray that we go down because we showed love to despicable, terrible, horrible, socially unacceptable people. If we go down because we loved too well, praise God, let it come. But if we go down because we don't live what we believe and we're judgmental and we're mean and we're, we're, we hate in the name of Jesus then woe to us because we did not hear the message that he came to deliver. And we have not really received who he is if we're not willing to treat others, especially those that we're allowed to hate, in a way that is of mercy, in a way that is offering grace. This is a means by which God, God gives us grace, and as he gives us grace, we're supposed to share it with even our enemies. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Jay back in 1981 who you gifted enough to speak words that led me to you. You invited me down to you and said, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I thank you for Bartimaeus and I thank you for Zacchaeus as well. And I even thank you, Lord, that the crowd just didn't get it because neither do we, not all the time. So I ask you, Lord, as we take and drink, we eat and drink, that you remind us who we are, whose we are, and that you make us more like you. In Jesus' name, through your spirit, for your glory. Amen. Um, Please rise and receive God's good word. Look, if Jesus will save Jeffrey Dahmer, Zacchaeus, He'll save you. There's nothing that you've done that he can't redeem and he can't, there's nothing that he, he can't cover you for. So there's some comfort in that. But let us be, when he invites you to come to him, let us be either Zacchaeus or Bartimaeus or like the people following Bartimaeus. But let us not be the people who saw God do something wonderful 
to one of his children that they chose not to like, and they basically cursed God for God's good work. Let's be the people that praise God for God's good work, no matter where he shares it. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you. Be gracious to all of you. The Lord turn his counter. God give you his face and smile at you and give you peace. And all of God's people say, amen. Go with and in.